from our earlier discussion, mental health was one of the big areas I'm focused on, especially because of losing an only child to addiction. And looking at that history of how he got there, you know, with um, traumatic events occurring early in his school years, and then my deployments, I'm a 9-11 survivor. And so what's it like for a child who's 12 years old to see the, the buildings fall and knowing your mother's in the Pentagon? Wow. And nobody's addressing those mental health issues. And then going back to an earlier incident when um, he was in third grade and his basketball coach who was a Vietnam veteran, murdered his wife and, and killed himself. Wow. And both the children were in my son's class. So, you know, you look at these traumatic events throughout a childhood. And again, you throw a few deployments in there. We are thinking about this holistically, about the impact of all these events. And now the pandemic. And I'm sure, you know, the, our minority communities have been impacted more greatly by the pandemic and our military families, even more with our deployments and then responding to the riots and everything else. What do you think we need to be doing? I mean, Rochelle and um, Consuelo, what do we need? What, how should we, you talk about the power of one. What do you think we should be sharing with our listeners today to be thinking about some of this? What could we do? What are what are a few things we could be doing? I know for me is, you know, break down the stigma. There's help out there. Let's talk about it. That was one of my big campaigns. Let's talk about it. To me, that's one of the first things we could be doing. And and I think. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Risha. Oh, thank you so much. And, and I think, you know, Consuela has said it all, really, you know, that connection that we have to have together. That's that's number one. That's crucial. You know, we're one voice, one vision within NWVU. And it's not about one of us. It's about all of us all the time. We have to have that collective voice and we have to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. We have to check on each other. So many times, you know, we forget to check on each other because we're so busy in our lives on Zoom now. And then, you know, before... Mm -hmm. We were all over the place in different meetings as leaders. And, you know, so sometimes we forget to check on those who are more vulnerable than others. So I think it's very important that we continue to have those conversations, bring them together. We wanted to have all those things online for Zoom because we knew that many women, they could not isolate it. Isolation will kill you when you're already in a dark place. Yes. We have to recognize we have to create a light for them. They have to have an avenue where they can reach out to someone, someone who's going to listen to them, someone who has like experiences and know that they're being heard. Amen. So it's so almost like a sister check in. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that what, what we, I, I could add to that is we have to have the courageous conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we're, we're, we're dealing with the racism, all of the things that have happened to our nation mm -hmm. and, and to our sisters, what just happened to our Asian brothers and sisters just recently in Atlanta, that these are important topics to talk about. We as a people, as, mm -hmm. as the constitution says, right? We the people. The pursuit of happiness, right? But for women veterans, you know, we we need to first have that courageous conversation among the sisterhood. Mm -hmm. You did it. You just, you know, demonstrated it by sharing the story of your beloved son. May he rest in peace. But there are many, many other stories that we can't. And then, as, as Rochelle has, has shown, now we heard. Now what do we do? And one of that is that support network, and that is to check on a sister. And, and if nothing else to say, you know, I'm here, I'm here. And, and maybe it's just a, a question of being heard, uh, having the centers, having the VA. Uh, I heard our, our leader talk about walking into a VA mm -hmm. and just knowing that uh, we are treated and considered as vital and inclusive. That to me, I mean, it brought just joy because I've been to many VA centers and that's not the culture. That's no, no, that's it's not. not. It's not the culture. No. And, and it kind of goes to, um, you know, something I'm thinking about too, when we think about women, 
we think about families and our, and our children. Do you think we need better legislation and better data collected on our children? Um, that's one of the things that's kind of alarmed me. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because um, just over the last few years, you know, when I've been at events, all of a sudden I have people coming up to me telling me that they've lost their military members and they've lost their children to mental health issues. But I don't see a lot of discussion about this within DOD or VA. Do we think that this is a gap that, you know, we need to be looking at some legislation to change the way we're providing services to our military children and families? I agree totally because I've been in our work in my human development company, we, We've had many, many, many military families participate in what we're doing with school districts. That's the main area of support for me. Mm -hmm. And again, they are there, they come and they say over and over again, I don't get that from anyone. And I'm a veteran. I, I don't get an opportunity to come and discuss the impact of my my time in service on my children. And, and I don't get an opportunity to look for those coping skills, not just for themselves, but for their children who are also going, that's why I call it intergenerational mm -hmm. trauma. We, we have to get out of that idea of, 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 well, yes, the veteran, but what about all of those in that inner circle of the veteran? Uh, and I say that as, as a sister of a, a brother who, who Vietnam, and the intergenerational trauma of his two children uh, was real. And while we supported my nephew and my niece, what if they didn't have that? Mm -hmm. What would happen? And some of them, um, some of those uh, nephews ended up being incarcerated. And if we look at the prison pipeline, you'll see that so much of what brought them to that door mm -hmm. was the trauma. Mm -hmm. along with literacy and, uh, you know, all of those other factors. Mm -hmm. But again, yes, uh, a big yes. Yeah. Uh, it would be wonderful to, to see and, and I would, holistically. I would definitely agree with everything that you said, Consuela. And in fact, you know, the family readiness groups, you know, they've created them. Um, they don't necessarily monitor them, I don't think, in a way to, that they can really push it out there and be a service to those families because of the distance between families as well. So I, I thought it was a wonderful thing Zoom came around because it also gave an opportunity for those FRGs to get together and talk to the families during the deployments and when they're not deployed, you know, because that has the importance of helping that soldier while they're working and while they're serving their country, knowing that the family is taken care of, knowing that they better understand what the soldier is going through. And, and I know when I was Chief of African American Services for the Department of Children and Family Services, when I left Veterans Affairs and I went to DCFS, I was very concerned about how families who both parents are deployed or one parent deployed and they come home, they're not really well sometimes when they come back, they have changed, they go through this trauma business. What about the children? What's the effect of the children? And I started looking at some data on that where D was looking into the families and the outside entities having to come in to do investigations about abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And I don't think other than doing the A, um, the accountability, government accountability act, well, I don't remember seeing anything after that. Mm -hmm. So it's like a hit and a miss. You know, mm -hmm. we look at some things and then once we look at it, then it's gone away and we never see it again. So I think we need to revisit things like that to make sure our families are well when they come back from service and still be able to stand, you know, up for them, make sure they know where the resources are for the children so they can get a respite also. Mm -hmm. They're coming from fatigue battle. We have yes. to make sure that when they come home, they're not overwhelmed by, you know, the flood, that they now have responsibilities back again, you know, with their families of being the man of the house or the woman of the house or together. 
Well, it's almost like a theme I hear everyone saying that we need to be thinking about mental health as part of whole health. You know, when I look at um, mm -hmm. things like dental exams and eye exams, we all get a dental exam and eye exam on a regular basis. That's yes. considered part of our whole health. <clears throat> but we don't do a mental health screening. When do we do mental health screenings? You know, our brain is the most important organ in our body. It's the one we ignore, the one subject to hidden wounds, the one that drives everything about who we are. But we don't really do enough to take care of it. And um, our emotional and mental well-being is key to everything. Um, you know, we I heard the discussion on the incarceration. Like you said, so much, if we, if we go back in history for that person, if there was um, better intervention early on for mental health issues or trauma in that family mm -hmm. um, or, or the challenges, would they have ended up in a better place? And I would like to say yes. Um, and the challenges we have with child abuse is something I don't think it's elevated enough, um, especially with our military families. And, you know, when you're the single parent um, and you have three kids and your spouse is deployed and you're dealing with all these stressors, everyone reaches that breaking point. Yes. And, and, and you regret some of those actions sometimes. Um, and I think it's further aggravated if we look at the um, demographics of our military family now. Um, 60% of our active component at least lives in, in the community and all of our garden reserve. And I think there's a huge gap right there if we look at the connection of resources, especially for the mental health, which is key to everything. Yes. And that's one of the reasons when we started having the stand downs for women veterans, mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, it used to be where they were inviting all of the homeless. And, and I said one day, I said, well, this is not making any sense to me. Let's not wait until they get homeless to try to have the resources and information for them. Let's give it to them in advance. So if, in fact, they have those situations, that they would already know how to get help and yep. not wait until they get homeless. And then we try to help them. Sometimes yes. we're not proactive in those ways. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, whatever old adage is.